to destroy that covering. Do you know it seems like this worry leaves and that care goes? Things that troubled you all your life suddenly are no more. Things that worried you night and day are suddenly gone. And the deeper you go in this thing, even those hard and heavy ones that hit, it's like there's not a care in the world. It's not like something in you knows that the Lord has took over and that He is in control. Hallelujah. And the Bible says even unto this day when Moses is read uh, under that law mindset that there is a covering, uh, a veil that is over the minds of the people. There may not be a real veil hanging in a tabernacle somewhere, but that's not the veil we're worried about. Now Jesus rent that veil in twain from top to bottom. But the veil you have to deal with now is when that darkness tries to come upon your mind and cloud your thoughts when you know the way the Lord has said that it's going to be. And that dark cloud of discouragement tries to come upon your mind. But how many know even then the Bible said if you just turn to the Lord the veil is taken away. Hallelujah and that we with open face beholding in a glass the glory of the Lord are what? Changed. Now I want you to know it didn't say that that thing you're looking at changes first. That's not what has to change first. The first thing that has to change is our mentality of that thing. If you want a child to change, if you want finances to change, if you want your ministry to change, you have first got to get that change in your thinking. And if you let the mind of Christ come up into you and you begin to think with the thoughts of God, that's the first change that counteracts every other change. I'll tell you how it really works is you'll get so you don't even care about that other. You don't even care what you say, my God, the Lord's got that under control. Why bother? Why fuss with it? Why fool with it? Come on, somebody. You know you got in the Spirit when you can quit you fussing over it. When you can stop rehearsing it. When you can stop repeating it. When you can just let go and let God. Hallelujah. And then two or three weeks later, there comes your miracle rolling right in. You glory to God. You stood out there at the road and hunted it for two years and didn't see it. But you let the Spirit do a work in you. And two or three days later, here comes the blessing. Here comes the answer. Here comes the miracle. Here comes the money. Here comes the phys physical touch that you so desired. Amen. So I can tell you now that until that shift happens, this out here won't do nothing. 
And that's where we meet a challenge in dealing with people. They look at us in their hard situation and say, pray God will do something about this. And the truth is, the first thing the Lord has to do is a change within them. Hallelujah. And how many of you are dealing with folks right now trying to get them to see that if they'll just back off and let go and, oh my, hallelujah, just turn loose and get in the spirit and let the Lord fight the battle. Hallelujah. That God is able, amen, to make all grace abound towards you. Praise the Lord. So this morning, don't you try to spend all your time working on the thing in hand. You get in the spirit. You tune into heaven. You let the change come to your mind. And I'll tell you what, you go over there and sit down in his presence and while you're about to get in a glory spell, they'll come knocking on your door and say, this has changed. This has turned around. Can you say that? Do you know in this week alone and last week, some of the biggest turnarounds that has happened Things that year that that when it first happened we were so devastated in seeking God and finally we just had to give it up and tell the Lord it's yours. And without anybody making any efforts, praise the Lord, God just turned things around. I'll tell you there was miracles in here last Sunday morning. Supernatural miracles that only the Holy Ghost could make happen. And nobody had to prod it or pull it or try to get it to work. We just got in the high anointing here. From the minute we were in here, the high spirit of God took over. Honey, when you get in the anointing, he can do more in one service than you can take care of in three or four years of toiling and laboring. How many is going to get in the spirit today and let the Lord fight the battle. Hallelujah. All your words hadn't made a difference. All you did was get in a bad mood over it. And you hadn't changed anything. Just let the Lord fight the battle. Let the Lord, everybody raise your hand and say, I'm going to let the Lord. Hallelujah. I'm going to let the Lord have this thing today. I'm not going to sit here and try to figure out how to change it. I'm just going to get in the spirit like Elijah did on the mountain uh, and I'm going to hear from heaven hallelujah and see it cost us everything when we're worried it'll cost us a good message we won't be able to listen good because we're so distracted it'll cost us worship because you can't turn loose and worship God if you're distracted over a bunch of other stuff but when you're able to just let the, let, let the eagle wing take you up let the breeze of the heavenlies take you high then what happens is you get so caught up in the spirit when you come back down sometime the Lord's already went ahead of you and done something about it. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. 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 Praise the Lord. For the word of the Lord unto thee this day is not to worry and not to fear. Neither fret nor wring your hands any longer, saith the Spirit of God. For as you yield to me this day, and as you become a, a part of my presence and get overwhelmed with my glory, yea, I will loose troops that you know not of. I, I will loose the armies of heaven in your behalf, saith the Spirit of the Lord. Yea, I will cause my great number to march among that that has troubled you, and among that that has cost you your victory and yea even as you praise me here I will work over there saith the spirit of God even as uh, you yield to me here uh, I will go out into those places uh, that have been hard and difficult uh, and I will uh, produce uh, a way uh, uh, for the victory saith God uh, so this day think no more of it uh, meditate not upon it uh, but think upon that that is lovely and good uh, and of a great report uh, and yield thy mind 
find only unto my word and my presence this day and you shall find that after you come back down from this glorious trip in my presence I will have made the crooked path straight and I will have made that which is high be, be brought low and that which is low shall come up as well and you shall see a plain of pure victory saith the Lord hallelujah well glory to God somebody is going to get a miracle while they're sitting in their service this morning somebody is going to go home and find that God has moved in your behalf somebody and if it would I were you I'd be the somebody till everybody was that somebody is going to find out that God has moved for you as you sit here in his anointing and in his presence this morning can you say amen it is the time we'll remember all those prophecies we got last week in it's time for it to end. It's time for it to be over. It's time for us to come into ours. Uh, and the Spirit said that bountiful bounty. That's what the Holy Ghost said. Bountiful bounty. And how many of you are ready for the Lord to get bountiful in your behalf? Hallelujah. God bless you this morning. Praise. Go ahead and turn to Judges 4. I'm just going to read some without Deborah this morning. Hallelujah. And it said, The people of Israel cried out to the Lord for help that their 900 chariots of iron and oppressed the people of Israel cruelly for 20 years. So here, the people of Israel, they had been dealing with someone, tormenting them for 20 years. And they had a change of judges here. And it says, Now Deborah, a prophetess, the wife of Lapidoth, was judging Israel at the time. She used to sit under the palm of Deborah between Ramah and Bethel in the hill country of Ephraim. And the people of Israel came up to her for judgment. And she sent and summoned Barak, the son of Abim Noam, from Kadesh Naphtali, and said to him, Has not the Lord, the God of Israel, commanded you, Go gather your men at Mount Tabor, taking ten thousand from the people of Naphtali and the people of Zebulun? And I will draw out of Sisera the general of Jabin's army to meet you by the river Kishon with his chariots and his troops, and I will give him into your hand. And Barak said to her, If you will go with me, I will go. But if you will not go with me, I will not go. And she said, I will surely go with you. Nevertheless, on the road which you are going will not lead you to your glory. For the Lord will sell Sisera into the hand of a woman. And then Deborah arose and went with Barak to Kadesh. And Barak called out Zebulun and Naphtali to Kadesh. And ten thousand men went up at his heels, and Deborah went up with him. Now Heber the Kenite had separated from the Kenites, the descendants of Hobab, and the father-in-law of Moses, and had pitched his tent as far away as the oak of Zananinim, which is near Kadesh. And when Sisera was told that Barak the son of Abinoam had gone up to Mount Tabor, Sisera called out with all his chariots, 900 chariots of armor, and all the men that were with him from Harasha Haguyim to the river Kishon. And Deborah said to Barak, Up! For this is the day in which the Lord has given Sisera into your hand. Does not the Lord go out before you? So Barak went down from Mount Tabor with all ten thousand men following him. And the Lord rooted Sisera and all the chariots and all the armies from Barak by the edge of the sword. And Sisera got down from his chariot and fled away on foot. And Barak pursued the chariots and the armies. Let's go down to verse 17. But Sisera fled away on foot to the tent of Jael, the wife of Heber the Kenite. From there was peace between Jabin the king of Hazor and the king in the house of Heber the Kenite. And Jael came out to meet Sisera and said to him, 
Turn aside, my Lord, turn aside, and you do not be afraid. So he turned aside to her into the tent, and she covered him with a rug. And he said to her, Please give me a little water to drink, for I am thirsty. So she opened a skin of milk and gave him a drink and covered him. And he said, Stand at the opening of the tent, and if any man comes and asks you, Is anyone here? Say no. But Jael, the wife of Heber, took a tent peg and took a hammer into her hand, and then she went softly to him and drove the peg into his temple. And in his weariness he died. And behold, as Barak was pursuing, pursuing Sisera, Jael went out to meet him and said to him, Come, and I will show you the man whom you are seeking. So he went to the tent, and there lay Sisera dead in the tent bag in his temple. So on that day God subdued Jabin the king of Canaan before the people of Israel, and at the hand of Israel pressed harder and harder against Jabin the king of Canaan until they destroyed Jabin the king of Canaan. And you see right here the people of Israel, they had been going through a trial for over 20 years. And then they finally, with the change of judges, they got someone who had some wisdom of the Lord. They went to Deborah. And Deborah literally means a bee, an orderly motion, arrange, speak, subdue, to answer. And she was there, and she got the word of the Lord of how to end the whole thing, how the answer would come to them after all that time. And she called for Barak. And Barak means lightning, gleam, flashing, a casting forth. So she was the one with the speaking of the answer, and she got the one that could move fast. And you see, it's been said to us over and over that there's a quick work coming, that things are coming to an end. And just as it was prophesied, and not to worry, not to worry, but instead put your mind on Christ, and this is where the answer is. Now, with these people, the Israel, if they had been oppressed for 20 years, they were probably starting to worry that it was never going to end because it was a constant battle for them for 20 years. But it finally got, Deborah got the answer. She was resting under the palm tree just giving judgment, and Deborah got the answer. And lightning said to the speaker, come on, let's go together, and we'll end this thing. And then Deborah arose. She arose and she said, this day, is it to in your hand? And the Lord is saying, this day yes. is it to your hand yes. that you need to arise like Deborah yes. and you need to speak it yes. forth. And this day, not how can I work up and scrape and everything of little penny if it's a financial need or what medicine can I take to make me feel better? Or what can I do to try to reconcile them? Because it's not a physical work of the flesh, it's a work of the spirit. And that's what came upon Deborah. He said it was a work of the Spirit. I mean, it had been going on for 20 years. And then she finally got the revelation. And she said, arise. It's time for us to arise. And it was very interesting that the enemy, which I looked, tried to look at Cicero, but Cicero was an unknown word. So they had an unknown enemy. And she came into the hand of the woman. And jail means a wild goat, of, but literally a valuable ascension. And Heber, her husband, means a community, a society, and a charmer. So he came into a tent that he thought was just, a, just the community. He just thought he had a safe place, and he asked for water. And instead, she gave him milk and put him to sleep like a baby. And you see, that's when these things come to an end. The Lord is putting it to sleep like in, like a baby. But, but your faith is what is like jail when she took the tent peg and she drove it into Sisera's head. It's time for you to quit letting those thoughts nest into your head and for you to be swarming in a sea of circumstance. But it's time for you to give the milk to the baby, put it to sleep, and drive the peg into it and kill it. That's what the Lord is saying. That every bit of this that has been going on, it's not a trial of your flesh physically attacking you. It's a trial of your faith. And the Lord said last Sunday, I remember it distinctly, that you think you've been waiting on the Lord, but the Lord has been waiting on you to move on your faith. And as we've been seeing that, we have to come into unity. You 
see with this answer that came to Deborah and the Israelites is because they got into unity. It wasn't just Deborah and Barak, the two of them together trying to do it. When they came, the armies joined with them, set over 10,000 of them. And if we will become and we will form into unity, every answer that we have been leaving for will come swiftly. You can't go against the grain. You have to do it together. When Jesus was with his disciples, whenever there was turmoil, it's because one of the disciples wasn't agreed. When you think about when Jesus was there and he was resting in the bottom of the boat and all the seas and the waves were crashing, instead of the disciples doing what the Lord had taught them over and over to exercise their faith, they went to him, and he didn't, you know, get on. He got mad at them because he woke them up. But he didn't get on, oh, we got to get all this together and do all these things and try to make the sea stuff. He just said, peace, be still. Yeah. And that instant, and that lightning, and that's what the Lord is wanting us to do. It's just we're resting, but it's an exercising of your faith. Resting doesn't mean I'm just being lazy and just sitting there and doing nothing. Yeah. I'm exercising my faith. When we hear about, I forget who that is, but there was the lady that they didn't have any food on the table. And she didn't just sit there and worry and wring her hands and say, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? Instead, she went around the house and she praised the Lord. And then when it was supper time, she told the kids to get the table ready. And they put the plates on the table and the napkins and the silverware. She got a pitcher of water. And then they said, all right, let's pray and let's bless this food. And she said, Lord, I thank you for this food that we're about to receive. And every time she did it, there would be a knock on the door and somebody would leave some food on the doorstep for them. Hallelujah. And then I think about that there was a time that something had happened with our family. And everybody was really upset. And then all of a sudden my grandfather said, I remember that. I was a little girl, but I remember that. Why don't we just go get us some chicken? Because there was nothing else that we could physically do that it was time to move and act and to go on. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And then the... Um, the husband of Deborah, his name was Lapidoth, and his name means to shine a lamp or a flame. Well, we know that Jesus is the light of the world. So the prophet, if you, you're the prophet. You are. You're the prophet. You have the authority to speak into anything that should happen. And your husband is like Lapidoth. Because Jesus is the light of the world. And if you come together with your word and you allow Jesus to control your thoughts and your mind and your speech. You know, sometimes when you say things, it's okay to say, Lord, I didn't mean that. I take that back. I stand upon the word. Sometimes you have to talk to this flesh. Paul said, I die daily. And you know what? Sometimes you just have to. I'm talking about my own stuff. You start saying, you know what? I did not mean that. I was just mad at the time. And you have to just fix it. You can fix it because there is power in the tongue. There's life and death in the tongue. I had a dream about a month ago. And I won't go into great detail of the dream, but I had this dream that mom and dad and I were on vacation. And we had come up to this mansion that was turned into this old museum. And we entered this one room and it was decorated like Egyptian style. And... Everything was there, and you know, Egyptians are all about death. But uh, Dad was standing there, and he stepped on a tile. When he stepped on a tile, it was a trick, went to a trick door. And when we went to the door, inside of there was this old gray and dark, like, sepulcher, cave-looking place in there. And when we walked in, we walked, and there was this lady, and she was like gray, like she was the color of ash, but she was dressed in green. And it was like she was like a mummy. And Dad said, I said, is that lady dead? And Dad said, she's dead in her mind, but she's not dead in her spirit. We can't remember. And when he said that, all of a sudden, some men came in from our family, and Matt came in, and he had on a doctor's coat. And when they came in, they came in with a surgery table. And we laid that lady on the table. And all of a sudden, here comes my mom. And she said, I got the heart right here. And Matt grabbed the heart and put it in that lady. And we prayed over her. And as soon as we prayed to her, breath came into her. And she came to life. And we kept going from room to room. There were hundreds of rooms in that mansion. And we kept doing the same thing. We kept giving them heart surgery. 
life. And the Lord would show me that there are hundreds yeah. and hundreds of people yeah. oh. that because of the law churches that they've been into oh. and things that people have done to them, they become like a mummy. Yeah. They're like dead on the yeah. inside. Yeah. But that we are the heart healers. Yeah. That if the kingdom word will get into them, yeah. we can perform the surgery with our speech just like Deborah did. You know, they were trialed and trialed and trialed. It says that they were dealt cruelly with for 20 years. I don't know. If somebody's afflicted me for 20 years. I think I feel like giving up. But you know what? She got the word and they said, no, today it's in our hand. And that's what the Lord is saying, that today is the day for it to be come to an end and be in your hand. That this year, I know we're coming up to the end of it, but there have been promises that have been spoken and declared for this year, and this year ain't over with yet. And that the Lord, if you will speak it, and you will work on your faith, and you will not doubt if you keep standing upon the word, but you've got to do it by your faith, and you have to build your relationship with God. You can't expect to get new revelation if you don't join in fellowship with others and agree the word and allow the Lord to show you things. That's the only way that you will grow. I have some students in my class that they've realized that they can't just be lazy. Some of them, they didn't want to read. They didn't want to do their, they kept not doing their work. They kept getting in trouble every day. And we would take tests. And all of the kids that did their work and they read and they would practice every day, their scores went way up. And they got all these awards. And the ones that were not wanting to make a change they sat there on the Lord's Day with nothing. And they realized that they weren't getting any better. And it's just like that. If you practice your faith, you get better at it. And you get smarter at it. And the Lord gives you new things. Sometimes I sit back and I think, my God, all the things that you have shown us. Lord, I mean, we didn't know that we were like in a glass darkness, but the Lord has taken the veil off of our eyes and he's taken more veils and more veils and more veils that he's glorifying us within ourselves. Hallelujah. And it's time for you to sing because right after they won that battle, Barak and Deborah sang a long song of victory because it was over with. And when you see that it's over with, it's time for you to rejoice. Yeah. It's time for you to arise and receive your answer. Yeah. Hallelujah. It was also prophesied that our struggle is over. Yeah. Right. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And that if we will listen to the Lord's voice. And then there's a scripture. And you've heard it many times. But I'm going to read it in two different versions. Philippians 4, 6. And the message, it says, Do not worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything and thank the Lord for what he's done. Yeah. So after you pray about it, the Lord, you know, if he impresses upon your heart, keep praying, praying. But if you've prayed about it and you know the Lord has shown you the answer, quit going back to pray about it. You need to thank the Lord for what he's done. And I'm going to read it also in the mirror translation. And it says, let no anxiety about anything distract you. And that word distracts come from miramino. I don't know how to say that, but it means anxiety. And through the idea of distracting from Maritzo to divide, your requests do not surprise God. He knows your thoughts from afar and is acquainted with all your ways. Yet he delights in your conversation and childlike trust. And it says again, let no anxiety about anything distract you. Rather, translate moments into prayerful worship and soak your requests in gratitude before God. And I tell you, this has happened in my own life that when I, I remember, if I just keep talking about the problem and rehearsing it, nothing is accomplished. But when I get into worship and I thank the Lord for it every day and every time that thought comes to my mind, I tell it to shut up and I just start worshiping the Lord. And if I can't worship Him myself because I get thinking about it too much, I just put on worship music or some preaching and listen to that to change my mind. Hallelujah. And it makes me think of, I'll share this one story here. There was this lady minister that she came to ORU a lot. 
And she was, um, she kind of reminds me of Judy, because Judy didn't marry until she was older. And she was starting to get near 40. And she was going over and over, and she was like, Lord, I need a husband. Lord, I need a husband. I know I'm supposed to have a husband. And she was constantly, over and over, praying for a husband, but she never thanked the Lord. Instead, she kept allowing all of her, she was an evangelist, and she kept allowing all of her minister friends set her up with all these men that they thought were the right one for her. And she would get into these relationships with her, and with her, and she would date him for a few months, and then it would just end suddenly. And she would be completely heartbroken. She would be like, Lord, I just don't understand. I need a husband. You know how old I am, Lord. I need a husband. And so finally, there was one day that she was packing up, and that time she was going to go on vacation with her friends. And while she was on vacation, they were going to invite one of their male friends to come and go on a date with her. And while she was packing up, and she started to go take the trash out of her house, the Lord stopped her and told her not to go. She goes, what are you talking about, Lord? She's like, he's like, that's not the one. And the Lord showed her a vision. And in the vision, he showed her a road path. And while she was walking down the path, there were all these men that would come up and they would have a single rose in, her, in their hand for her. And they would put it out to her. And every time she was about to grab the rose from the man, the Lord said, no, that's not the one. Don't even look at him. Continue down my path. And she kept over and over walking down the path. And they would try to hand her a rose. And the Lord would tell her, no, you just keep walking down my path. They're not the one. And as she kept walking down that path, she finally got to the end of that path. And then there was a man that came and walked up beside her. And in his hand, he had a full bouquet of red roses. And the Lord said, this is the one. And they walked hand in hand down the path. And so that day, she called up and said, I can't make the trip. She told her friends, I can't do that trip. We can't, we can't do that. I don't want to meet the man. And she just rested in the Lord. And the Lord told her to start thinking him for the right one to come at his appointed time. And it was one month later, she was preaching in a service. And she saw the man in the vision, that who was her husband. And he came walking into her service, and he had brought a bouquet of red roses to give to her at the end of the service. And they were married within one year. And that was how the Lord also answered in Michelle O'Donnell. At the beginning when she started to get the, the keen revelation of divine love and that we don't have to have any dis-ease in our life and that he's not the author of confusion, that he's only good. She was going through a lot of health issues. And that was one reason why she wrote of monkeys and dragons. And when she was on the path, there were monkeys lined up on the path. She was going through physically. And every time she looked at the monkey, the monkey would come over and start biting at her ankles and attacking her physically. And she, But as soon as she would not look at the monkey and she would look straight on the path, the monkey would go right back to where it returned. And then as she was walking down the path, there were dragons above her. And every time she looked at the dragon, the dragon would start flaming its mouth and trying to attack her. But as soon as she looked her eyes right back on the path, every bit of it would stop. And the Lord showed her if she would stop looking at the disease and how to cure the symptoms, that she would get to the root of what it is, the Lord would heal her. And the Lord healed her of that situation. And through the years, she's passed on now, but through the years, she opened that clinic. Yeah. She was one of the very first holistic clinics that opened. And the Lord would show her the root cause. And all these different people would be completely delivered. There was one time that a woman came to her, and they didn't know much English, and nobody knew what was going on with that lady. And they were trying to give her treatments and stuff and she really wasn't getting better she was they needed some equipment that they didn't have at the clinic from the hospital and when they took her to the hospital she went to check on the lady and they said where is that lady and they said we can't take her and she goes you have to take her I said no 
And she's like, you have to take her. We have to be able to treat her. And they said, well, we can't put her anywhere in the ward. We have to put her down in the basement. And when it come to find out that the lady had leprosy. And when they went down there and they started just speaking the word over her and thanking the Lord. And Michelle knew that if she could raise the faith of the lady, even though she was completely gone, the Lord would completely heal her of it. <laughs> and they got to the answer and they treated her. And that lady, as far as I know, it's still cured today. But there was another situation with her sister and her brother-in-law. And I think they had either contracted AIDS or hepatitis. I can't remember which one. And they were getting very, very sick. And they took them to the clinic. And her brother-in-law started getting well right away. But her sister was all about, let's join these support groups. And let's try these medicines here. And let me keep going. And it was all about, she was completely depressed that that, that happened to her. And... She couldn't get over it, and her sister died. And that's what happens if we focus on the circumstance, yeah. there's death. If you focus on the yeah. flesh, there's yeah. death. Yeah. And it's not just about how we look on ourselves, because there's some people that you see, and they're like a facade. They know the word of the Lord. They know it in and out, mm -hmm. but they don't have a relationship. Yeah. Yeah. They're like... I, I remember one of my teachers showed an example that they're like an apple. She had two apples in a classroom. And she was just talking about kindness. But on the outside, both of the apples looked the same. But when she cut into one, it was completely brown and rotten on the inside. And because she had taken before the class, she had taken that apple and she had thrown it on the ground multiple times. Because you see, when you focus on the situation and you focus on the problem and you don't get in the Word and you don't thank the Lord and you don't worship, on the inside, your spirit is being bruised up and battered. On the outside, you might look like everything's fine, but on the inside, it's not. But the thing is, is that the Lord washes us pure from the inside out. He refines us as gold from the inside out. When they take bars of gold and they refine them, on the outside it still looks like gold. But on the inside there's impurities. So they burn it and they purify it and they cleanse it out. Hallelujah. And that's what the Lord does with us. I, I used to hear my papa say that, you know, he would talk about cows. And he would say sometimes I don't know how a black cow can eat green grass create white milk and then yellow butter, but then he knows that on that same thing that he puts the butter on a biscuit and he eats it. Well, sometimes there's people that they don't understand how a lamb can become a man and he can die for us and wash us with his blood and make us white as snow. But the Lord has done that within us. He cleanses us completely. And if we worship him, if we build that relationship with us, the Lord will answer everything. It will come about. It will be as suddenly. The Lord will move upon you like lightning, like Barak. And he will move upon you in speaking like Deborah. And he will say, today arise. And it will end. The Lord will give you guidance. You won't have to question him. Because if you fully have come up into a relationship with him. And you fully allow yourselves to build upon your faith. You won't question that the Lord hasn't given you the answer. He'll speak loud and clear with guidance. There was one time the Lord gave me a vision while we were in a prayer meeting. And I saw a bride. And she was dressed completely in black. And she was all depressed. And you could tell that she had been crying. And she came in there and she just said, I, don't, I just don't know how I'm going to marry my husband today. I'm not ready. And before I knew it, I don't know why I did this at first, but I grabbed, there was a pitcher of water there and I threw it on her. And when I threw it on her, she screamed the most blood curdling scream ever. And all of a sudden, from the bottom up, her dress started to turn white. And she turned to this most beautiful bride. And she said, thank you. Thank you. I finally know who I am. And it's like what the revelation that gave Pastor that we are washed in the water of the word. And as soon as she came like that, she came into herself. She went running down the altar to marry her, her 
groom that was there at the end. And the thing was that the Lord showed me that he was awakening people there. That's what we do when we come into the atmosphere. If we've been with Jesus, you know when you encounter people with like spirit. You know when they've been with Jesus. And you change the atmosphere. It doesn't matter if it's your job. If it's you physically in your body, if it's someone in your family, if it's your finances, it doesn't matter where you go. Even when you walk into Walmart, you know, sometimes I walk into Walmart and the Lord will just say, speak over that one right there. They're troubled in their mind. Speak over that one. They need a financial blessing. Sometimes the Lord will tell me to do something. There's times that there's students sitting in my classroom and the Lord will say, just touch them on the shoulder and speak peace over them today. And the Lord knows what to do, but it's the act of your faith that you arise in the Spirit to do it. And the next scripture I want you to turn to is Psalm 92. Thanks to the Lord, to sing praises to your name, O Most High, and declare your steadfast love in the morning and your faithfulness by night. To the music of the lute and the harp, to the melody of the lyre. For you, O Lord, have made me glad by your work, and at the works of your hands I will sing for joy. How great are your works, O Lord, your thoughts are very deep. The stupid man cannot know, and the fool cannot understand this, that though the wicked sprout like grass, and all the evildoers flourish, they are doomed to destruction forever. But you, our Lord, are on high forever. For behold your enemies, O Lord, for behold your enemies shall perish, and all evildoers shall be scattered. For you have exalted my horn like that of the wild ox, and you have poured over me fresh oil. My eyes have seen the downfall of my enemies. My ears have heard the doom of my evil assailants. And the righteous shall flourish like the palm tree and grow like a cedar in Lebanon. And they are planted in the house of the Lord. They flourish in the courts of our God. And they still bear fruit in old age. And they are ever full of sap and green. To declare that the Lord is upright. He is my rock and there is no unrighteousness in him. And even there, David, he's speaking about you. That if you will walk in this path the Lord has set before you, he will make you grow and flourishing. And blessing will just come upon you. Hallelujah. We were listening to Mike Murdoch the other day. And, and he was saying that he never believed the Lord for money. Because money isn't always the answer. He always believed the Lord for the ministry of prosperity to come upon his life. Because prosperity is just more than money. It's everything. It's your health. It's your family. It's your, your spirit being whole. It's everything. Hallelujah. And that's what the Lord does. But when we come in here and we let the Lord take care of it, that we allow the mind of Christ to rest within us, that he causes all the enemies to perish. He causes a calm to come over the storm. Hallelujah. He makes you anointed. Hallelujah. It says they're like the wild ox. Well, wild ox has the same meaning as jail. In that story about Deborah right there, the passage about Deborah, jail was the wild ox. And she put a th the thing to an end. And that's what the Lord does to you. He makes your faith like the wild ox that puts the things to an end. And then he causes you to ascend under the palm tree. Deborah, she rested under the palm tree. Hallelujah. And he makes you green and flourishing. Deborah could not, she could not have given that word that it was time to arise, that there wasn't a rest within her. The Lord hadn't shown her things over and over. A prophet isn't a prophet just by one second. It's been when in her. The Lord has shown her things for years. That's why people came and sought her for counsel. And it's time to arise. 
It's time to rise like Hannah. She was barren. And she went to Eli. And said, and, and she went praying before in the temple, and they thought she was drunk. And she was saying, Oh, the Lord, if you will give me a son, I will give him to you. And she went there, and they thought, like I said, they thought she was drunk, but she was in great, great sorrow. And Eli said, Because of your faith, the Lord shall give it to you. And the Lord gave her Samuel. And then when Samuel got to a certain age, she gave Samuel over to Eli. And we know the story where Samuel was called. And he was a prophet for many, many years. But what you have to know is that the Lord, with her promise, he gave her guidance in her path. Because every year when that boy was ready, she gave him a new coat. She didn't see him. Hallelujah, all the time. She had a new coat that was fashioned for him, and it always fit. That's what the Lord does. When he gives us the answer, it fits perfectly like a new coat. Hallelujah. And the answer is ready, and it's there. The Lord knows. Every time you come before him, the Lord knows exactly, exactly what you're going to come before him. He knows everything. He's omniscient, and he's omnipresent. That means he's there everywhere, and he knows everything all the time. There's nothing that's going to, it said it there in Philippians 4, there's nothing that can surprise him. He knows what's going to happen before. He knows the strands on your head. So quit acting like the Lord don't care for you, because he does. He cares for everything. I remember pastor sharing that story that they were going through a tough time and he felt like the Lord wasn't even hearing him at all. And while he was driving on the road, a sparrow fell on the car. And the Lord told him, if I mark, see the mark of a sparrow, I see everything about you. Hallelujah. He's so consumed with you. He's in love with you. You know, when you're in a relationship with someone, that's about all you can do is just you're truly in love with someone. Hallelujah. It doesn't matter if it's a, a physical romantic relationship or in love with your children or your parents. That's all you, you talk about. In love with your family. In love, even in love, you know, with working with ones. You, you talk about what you're in love with. And the Lord's even more consumed with you than any love that you can have on this physical world. He's so, so consumed for you. And he just wants you to come into him. And he just wants you to love on him so he can pour his love out onto you. He wants you to lay everything aside so that he can just show you who he is. All the ones, the great ones that you read about, it's because they let themselves completely be sold out to Jesus. And the thing is, if you let yourself be completely sold out to Jesus, you won't lose anything. You'll gain more. Hallelujah. And that's not just physical things. But you'll gain wisdom and knowledge in the Lord. And you'll go deeper and you'll reach more spiritual heights. And you won't be so concerned about everything. Things will he'll build you up like the rock of Gibraltar. You'll stand tall. You'll stand firm. The Lord will cause you to be a mighty well for him. Or springs of healing will flow out of you. Or springs of anointing will flow out of you. That people will come to you for guidance. Because they know that the anointing is on you. There's so many. You don't know. I've heard Heather say it. Sister Heather say it. That there's some that have even left this church, but they know who has the power. And they're the ones that call whenever they have a concern or a real need that they know they need an answer for. And we're the ones that do that. And there's quick answers all the time. And there's even more coming. We've already had two people come back to life. And there's even more that we will raise and that it's been prophesied over this place that we are a center for healing. And it's been prophesied, if you read those prophecies, that we will branch out, that it's not just contained in this building, but it's for the entire world. The Lord is going to send missionaries out of this place. I believe that I'll be one of them at times. That out of this place, the Lord will send missionaries into the darkest 
places that they will give them a revelation because there's some people they're just relying on what man has taught them but it's time for us that we can teach them to understand the kingdom of God yeah. my God if my husband role can change the whole atmosphere of the Bahamas by teaching them about the kingdom of God that there's more prosperous people there over and over that he can change a whole nation we can change this nation we can change the other nations we're ambassadors to the world hallelujah the Lord has been upon us to speak to speak forth the, the answer but you have to arise you have to arise and listen for the voice again it's not a conjuring up of anything man made by flesh but it's a rising of the spirit and you have to listen no matter how weird it sounds because God is a peculiar God and sometimes there's things that don't make any sense sometimes it does I mean the Lord's told me to do some weird things before and I'm like oh gosh but in obedience, when I did it, the answer came. Yes. Hallelujah. And I'm just going to end us out with Galatians 6. I'm going to read it out of the mirror translation. It said, Brethren, if it seems that someone continued to anticipate their next failure from your position in faith, restore such a person in a spirit of courtesy and grace, keeping your own attitude in check. A legalistic approach would want to suspiciously probe into problems. The law of the Christ life distinguishes your spirituality. Taking the weight off someone's shoulders is fulfilling the law of Christ. And anyone who imagines to be someone they are not lives a lie. Now, without the pressure of pretense, you are free to give expression to your individual self and not some phony life you're trying to fake. Evaluate your own conduct in such a way that you do not need another's approval to confirm your joy. Everyone ultimately lives his own life. Both student and teacher draw from the same source. They equally participate in every good thing. The word they share echoes its distinct resonance within them. Show business does not deceive God. Do not be led astray and then pull your nose up at God as if it was God who let you down. The harvest always reveals the seed. The flesh could not compete with the spirit. Just like with Adam, the fruit of the do-it-yourself tree still produces death, while faith produces the spirit fruit of the life of the ages, the God kind of life. Every good deed has a predictable harvest. Let's not get discouraged in the in-between times. Let us take advantage of every opportunity to be a blessing to everyone we meet without neglecting our fellow faith family. Hallelujah. Be blessed.